Hello and welcome to uh, section 9.3. So now we're getting into a different type of hypothesis test, but holy smokes, it is so similar to the first hypothesis tests that we did in uh, module 9-1. Again, you can see we're looking single population mean one tail test. We're still looking at lower tail, upper tail. We'll also have two tail tests. The only difference now is this little piece of information that sigma is now unknown. So when the population standard deviation is unknown or the population variance is unknown, <clears throat> the only difference is that now we have to use the T distribution. So because sigma is unknown, we have to estimate it using S or in the case of a population variance, we're estimating that with S squared, which of course, this is the sample standard deviation or the sample variance. Now, when we're using the sample variance, well, now we have to use the T distribution. The T distribution is a little bit different than the standard normal distribution, but so similar. You should have no problem using this T distribution. There's one little detail that we have to take into consideration when we're using the t-distribution, and that is this thing called degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom always correspond with the degrees of freedom used in estimating the variance. So, what the heck do I mean by that? Well, when we're looking at a, a population variance, you know that's the difference between each individual observation in the population and the population mean squared, summed across that population, and here we divide that by n. When we are estimating the population variance with the sample variance, well, much of this calculation is the same, except before I can estimate sigma, I must first estimate mu. So here we say well, there's this intermediate estimation. Before I can estimate sigma, I have to first estimate mu. And so we estimate mu, the population mean, we estimate that with the sample mean, and now I can calculate my estimate for the population variance. Because of that intermediate estimate, where I have to estimate mu first before I can estimate sigma, that's where we say I lose one degree of freedom. Okay, so our degrees of freedom for our variance is n minus one. So what that means is for our t distribution, we have this n minus one degrees of freedom. What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, here's what those t tables look like. A little bit different from the z tables. The z table, remember we had, there's just one normal distribution. We had a whole bunch, we had probably hundreds of probabilities on there to four decimal places. We had a number of uh, maybe 30 different critical values to two decimal places. We had lots of detail about that standard normal distribution. There's just one of them. We had lots of detail about it. The T distribution, now there's a lot of different variants. The shape of that distribution is affected by the sample size. So here I can see in this first column is where we have degrees of freedom, starting at one and increasing. As my sample size grows, and therefore my degrees of freedom grows, well, we really start to resemble very much a standard normal distribution, where here, this is a familiar value, if I had z for 0.025, well, that equals 1.96. And if I follow this all the way up to the top, well, that's where I can see there's that probability 0.025. So when my sample size increases, that T distribution, it starts to lie on top of. In other words, it starts to look identical to a standard normal distribution. So how do we use this table? Well. In some ways, it's much easier because 
we have only a little bit of information about each of those distributions. So it's less overwhelming than the standard normal. Standard normal, sometimes it can be daunting to look at that table and try to find just that one value that you want. The t distribution, if I know what my sample size is, say my sample size is 10, I can ignore almost everything on this sheet of paper. And if my sample size is 10, I okay, there's 10 minus 1, I have 9 degrees of freedom. These are the only critical values that I care about. Those are the critical values that correspond with these probabilities. I can ignore everything else on that table because my t distribution is reliant on my sample size. And of course, there's only one sample size in any given problem. So once I've identified the appropriate t distribution for my problem, I ignore all the rest. So it's a little bit simpler in that way. There's a bit of a trade-off though. Because we have less detail about each particular variant of the t-distribution, I am not going to be able to get an exact p-value anymore. So let's say we're going through a test, and let's say my test statistic is 1.9. So I have a t that is equal to 1.9. Well, again, I'm ignoring everything except what I have highlighted in yellow. So I can see, okay, 1.9 is... You know, kind of between these two numbers. Not exactly in the middle, but, you know, it's between these two. What that means is my relevant probability is going to be between these two numbers. So these are upper tail probabilities. That's a little bit different, too. The z-distribution tends to give lower tail probabilities. Here I have an upper tail probability. So what this is telling me is that here's my t-distribution look something like this. I have these two values. I'm going to exaggerate a little bit on my distances, but here I have 2.26, and that gives me an area here in that upper tail of 0.025. Then I have 1.83, and that gives me an area in the upper tail, so that includes that red space of 0 0.05. If my test statistic is between 1.8 and 2.6, so let's say my test statistic sits right here, that's 1.9, well then my p-value for an upper tail test is going to be that region. So my p-value from what I can see here graphically, my p-value is smaller than what I've shaded in blue, but it's larger than what I've shaded in red. So that is the extent to which, you know, the detail that we can get using the t-distributions. It won't be a problem for us. Because imagine this is an upper tail test and my level of significance is 5%. Well, if my level of significance is 5%, I can see I can't see exactly what my p-value is, but I can see it's less than 0.05. So that gives me enough information to reject. Good. Okay, if it's a two-tail test, exactly the same kind of rules apply as when we looked at previous uh, tests using the z-table. If it's a two-tail test, I would need to multiply those probabilities by two. And so my p-value would be uh, greater than 0.05, less than... Point one. Okay, so that's enough of an introduction to our t-distribution. Let's go back up now and look at our particular problem here. So we're looking at the installation of red light cameras. And red light cameras, uh, they're an effective deterrent in reducing the number of people who run red lights. But of course, they're expensive to install. So we only want to install them at intersections where there tends to be a lot of accidents caused by people running red lights. So let's assume we have a threshold number of accidents at uh, 12 per year. Any more than this warrants a camera. There's our clue for what kind of test we might, we might want to do. Any more than this is where we're going to put a camera. At one location we found the average number of accidents over a 10-year period is 12.6. Based on this data, 
they immediately submitted recommendations to install a camera at this intersection. After all, 12.6 is greater than 12, right? This is one of the, the, the biggest problems uh, that I find students struggle to overcome is that I can see 12.6. Well, yeah, that's greater than 12. So we should go ahead and put a camera there. But remember, these are just random events, right? Every year, this is over a 10 year period, every year the number of accidents has been something different. Some have been maybe above and some have been perhaps below. So those 10 years, those 10 observations, those would be individual observations. Whether or not that constitutes a, a, a population average, a actual average that is greater than 12, well, that's the purpose of testing. Is that difference, which is really just 0.6, is that difference statistically significant? Or is it just the result of, you know, the, the random nature of the number of accidents that happen year after year? Is it, is it due simply to the variation that exists within that sample? So I think we've sufficiently justified uh, a was it that a correct decision well no i mean maybe it does turn out to be statistically significant but there's a more appropriate approach and that is of course to perform a hypothesis test to see whether or not that difference is in fact statistically significant so i would set this up as an upper tail test because we only want to put cameras where the average is greater than 12. So if our evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, well, there's a good spot to put a camera. If our evidence supports the null hypotheses, well, then it's, it's, it's not more than our threshold. In other words, we should not put a camera there. And then we can do this at whatever level of significance. Here we have 0.05. Notice the similarities here between the earlier tests that we did using the Z distribution. So far, nothing's been different. The next step, same process, calculator test statistic. Now, when you are using the Z distribution, that formula looks something like this. Using the T distribution, you can barely notice a difference. Just some of the letters change. Now I'm using a T, so I show a T. Now I'm using the sample standard deviation, so I have an S instead of a sigma. But otherwise, the nature of this calculation is extremely similar. Uh, where's my S? Oh, here we assume we do have the sample standard deviation as 135 divided by the square root. Well, this is the average over a 10 year period. So let's see what this is going to give us. 12.6 minus 12 over 1.35 root 10. So here I have a T statistic of 1.41. I'm rounding it to two decimals. What's next? It's the same as Z tests. Now we can do a critical value approach. We can do a p-value approach. So first of all, we need to know what is the variant, which T distribution are we going to be using? So our degrees of freedom here, if I have 10, well, I have 10 minus one, so we have nine degrees of freedom. Let's go p-value first. So nine degrees of freedom, my test statistic is 1.41. I come down to my T distribution I've already got what I need highlighted in yellow. I can get rid of this stuff here. I'm looking for 1.41. Well, okay, so 1.41, that's in here. It's between these two numbers. So my relevant probabilities then, they have 0.05 and 0.1. That's an upper tail probability. I'm doing an upper tail test. If I were doing a lower tail test, I would use one minus both of those. And my relevant probability would be between 0.9 and 0.95. I'm not doing that. 
we're doing an upper tail everything's just as we want it so my probability is between 0.05 and 0.1 in fact that's my p-value is going to be between less than 0.1 greater than 0.05 now before we draw a conclusion I know you want to draw a conclusion right away let's look at the critical value so alpha is 0.05, I come down here, and again, I'm still ignoring everything in that table, except what I have highlighted in yellow. So now I'm looking, here's the, my probability, 0.05, there's my critical value, 1.83, my yellow disappeared. So my critical value here, again, because this is alpha, is 0.05, the t value that corresponds with that is 1.883. So I can come back up to my problem. My critical t with 9 degrees of freedom at 0.05 is 1.833. So this means I have a t distribution that looks something like this. It looks exactly, almost exactly like a z distribution. Generally, when you have a lower degrees of freedom, your T distribution gets a little bit shorter and a little bit chubbier in the tails. When, a, when your sample size increases, it starts to get a little skinnier, a little taller. So here I have my critical value, 1.833, just like previous tests that we've done. That defines my rejection space. Below that is my do not reject space. I have a test statistic here of 141. And so quite clearly, and this is often why I like to draw pictures and why I would recommend you guys practice drawing pictures is because then it's easier to really see your result. Because if this is an area here of 0.05, which is my level of significance, well then, this area here, which includes that, clearly is greater than 0.05. So I can see consistency again between my p-value approach and my critical value approach. Both of them are leading me to not reject the null hypotheses, which means that I am unable to support the alternative. So really, coming back to this statement again, was it the correct decision? Well, no, because I hadn't done the analysis. But now we can really more concretely say it was actually the wrong decision because doing the analysis, now I, I do not have evidence to show that that difference is statistically different, that this 0.6 difference is statistically significant. So that average of 12.6 it's just the result of the random nature of the different number of accidents that have happened year after year after year. It does not represent a population average that is actually greater than 12. As a consequence, I cannot recommend the installation of a red light camera at this particular intersection based on this threshold. Maybe if we changed that threshold, well then everything would change. But based on that threshold, we cannot recommend the installation of a camera. Okay, so I hope that that was helpful. We'll go through a few other exercises with some little differences here and there. But generally speaking, I think you'll see a lot of similarities with what we have already done. Okay, thanks for watching everybody. Bye-bye.